Hi, right, Dr. Klein here. I'm here today to talk about the COVID-19 virus. Obviously, we're going through a pandemic over here. First, I just wanted to go through a few things on why it's COVID-19 or where they get that name from. So the CO stands for the corona. That's why everybody's calling it corona. The I, the virus, and the D is for the disease. So that's actually the disease part, not the name of the actual virus. When the virus has come around, they're calling it the 2019 Nova coronavirus. So it was the novel one, and then generally it was the SARS-CoV-2 is actually the name of the virus that we're going to talk about today. So just to backtrack, so if we go back to different virals, different pandemics that we had had in the past. Everybody remembers the SARS, and this was back in 2002, usually about every 10 years it appears that something's coming up. So generally this thought this was initially coming from bats that went to a cat called the civet. So generally you're looking at here as far as the case fatality rate, so at that point there was only 8,000 people generally in the world that actually had the disease, and out of that, 800 of those died. So it was 10% death rate. So generally, if you had it, there was a 10% chance that you were going to die. And looking at the MERS and the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, so this was the next kind of pandemic that we had that we were all probably still akin to because it's not that long ago. This was back in 2012. Again, it was the bat, was the initial host, which kind of seems pretty much normal. We'll look through some of that. And then this went to the camel. Again, I didn't know if it was a one hump or two hump Campbell, so I took the liberty of putting the one hump in there. Uh, generally, at this point, less people were infected, 2,500, but 850 of those people died, so really the mortality rate or the case fatality rate was 34%, which is pretty high. So now looking at the COVID 19, the one that we're here to talk about today. So, right now, and these are the numbers as of, I guess they were last night. This is today's, uh, I guess, April 30th. So right now, I think these are up to about 230, and this is about 3.25 million. So that's already gone up since last night till this morning, with the day being April 30th. So here they thought the initial host, and again, they're not really sure. The initial host they thought was the bat, because there's about a 96% actually genetic commonality between the COVID-19 virus and the bat. They thought maybe it went to an interesting animal that I never even heard about until this, called the pangolin. Um, just because its scales, I guess, are used for medicinal purposes, and it's sent all over the world. Um, now they're not really sure if that was an intermediate host. They're kind of thinking that there may be some other type of intermediate host or maybe direct contact for the bat. There's also some contemplation that it may have been from a, a viral lab that was actually studying bats and coronavirus in particular because that was only about four miles away from the Wuhan wet market there. So nobody's exactly sure where it necessarily came from. They're trying to still track that down. But the important thing is here, this is looking like a 14%. So when I gave this lecture similarly about a week ago, it was at a 14.5%. But that's based on the numbers that we have here, the positive tests, right? So we know this number actually to be artificially much lower than the 14%. Not artificially, it truly is much lower. Uh, generally when they did a study out in New York uh, last week, and it took about 3,000 people that were asymptomatic, never had any exposure, or nothing had any kind of COVID-19 infection. And generally out of those, 21% they did an antibody test, 21% had positive antibodies. So they're indicating that there was perhaps then in New York State, the state of New York alone, there was 2.7 million people already that probably had had the coronavirus, and some of those people already had antibodies for it. So because of that number, the high artificial number, it kind of makes people get that sense of panic. I think this was taken from uh, that Walking Dead TV show. Uh, but there's kind of like a sense of panic in the individuals because they think that basically if they get it, there's going to be a 14 or a 14 and a half percent chance of them dying. So it instills a lot of fear, and this lecture is more to instill a little bit more comfort and actually more empowerment, I think, on our behalf. We'll get into some of those things why that should be. So when you see stuff like that, everybody wants to walk around like this with their respirators and their full masks. I know when I was in the COVID unit initially, uh, they everybody had the spacesuits. I just had my goggles and, and appropriately so my K95 masks and all, N95 masks. But you still feel like, oh, geez, this thing is almost like alive and it's trying to attack me. So the important things we're going to learn about is that the masks are very important and really hand hygiene. So those are probably the two most important things. Some of the other things that we look at, the goggles, if it gets aerosolized, that's going to be kind of important. With the gowns, they're still really not too sure what to make of that. Um, some of the things that are seen even without a surgical mask, and that's what these things are, and not as opposed to N95 masks, but even without a surgical mask, there's perhaps maybe only like a 5 to 10% transmission rate that you are likely to get infected in those circumstances uh, with limited contact. 
So we just go through some other things just like the flu because we're all familiar with the flu. So this is just from October to April 4th, so a couple weeks ago. So just to give you an idea, there was somewhere around 56 million people at this point that actually had problems as far as catching the flu in 62,000 deaths. So the flu in itself kills a lot of people. So this is a little bit, spreads a little bit more quickly and we'll get to some of those numbers. So this is why it's a little bit more fearful at this point. Uh, luckily the virus isn't as deadly, say maybe as like the MERS virus had been in the past. Another thing I also look at is like malaria. So here's a, here's a diagnosis and a thing that kills many people. So we're looking here, big thing here is preventable and curable. So I mean this is a disease that we, we know what's caused by, we know how to prevent it, we know how to cure it, but some of it's because of lack of funding, even though there's $2.7 billion that we, our country, sends over there, and it's mostly in Africa where there's a problem. But this is something that we kind of work on, and it's still, at this point, in 2018, and anyway, the most recent numbers I could get, there's 228 million cases of malaria, right? So that's an awful lot. There were 405,000 people in that year died of malaria. And the bigger thing with that is most of the people are under five, about 67%, so it's mostly the kids that are kind of affected. So here's a disease that we know what causes it, it's preventable and curable, and we still have some issues with it. Now this is gonna be an older graph because it's about a couple of weeks old now, you can see from 412. Um, at this point, they're just indicating that it looked like the curve was going more even down. Maybe everybody was saying that disease is spreading a little bit less or the virus is spreading a little bit less. But the reality at that point, at this point, is we only had capability of testing about 145,000 cases a day. Uh, so now at this point, a week later, uh, or maybe two weeks later, now they're jacked up to about 200,000 cases a day that they can actually test. Uh, so some of it's a little bit of artificial rounding off. Uh, but this is just an important thing because they're only testing the symptomatic people and people that were, and at least in the state of Pennsylvania, even if you were not symptomatic, they wouldn't even test you. Uh, so they're only testing symptomatic people. So the numbers previously that we saw, even though it was like 3.25 million people, those are 3.25 million people that were tested that were symptomatic people. So we're missing many, many more people that had the virus. Uh, they speculate that perhaps Maybe there's two different strains of the virus, what they're thinking right now. So 70% of them are a little bit more virulent, and they think that 30% are a little bit less common, or not so virulent. You may be even asymptomatic. And the thought was the lesser one was actually directly related to the initial virus. So either that was from the mutations, uh, well, it's not the mutations from the animal, so, so zoological, or it was from that viral lab, we don't know where it came from. But then that kind of mutated into maybe a more serious strain. Uh, which is then we find to be a little bit more deadly. So to understand about how it spreads, we look at the reproduction number, or what they call the R0. Um, so generally, this is one person can transmit it to three people, and that's an R0 of three. So everything has an R0 number. So it could be one to one, which is kind of optimal. Well, actually, one to less than one is the most optimal, because then it just kind of fades off and dies out. When it's one to three people, so then three people, we give it to nine people. You know, and then nine people can give it to 27 people. So it adds up pretty quickly. So this is basically time to say how reproducible or the spreadability of this virus. So we look at some common things. So right now they're speculating about 2.5, uh, 2 to 2.5. And that was a while ago. Right now they're probably somewhere between 2 to 4 is where they think maybe the R0 for the COVID-19 is. Where you look at the flu, it's only 1.5 on average. So there's only one person can spread it to one and a half people per se, as opposed to here, it's now two to two and a half or maybe even up to four people. So this is a little bit more spreadable than the flu, which is why we have to be a little bit more concerned. And you see here something like the MERS, that was much more. So that could go to two to maybe five or six, you know, 7.2 on the outside. Uh, but remember that was very deadly, right? So it was more easily to contain because if people got it, we knew because 34% of the one third of them were dying. The next thing to look at for spreadability is called the series interval. So right now they're thinking probably, and this is an older graph again, and when I say older, it's only like a week or older, uh, but generally goes from about four to seven, uh, is where they're thinking that maybe some of the series interval uh, is for basically the COVID, as opposed to the SARS, where we see that was kind of a more flattened thing. So the series interval is basically an interval that we take if I were to say get COVID-19, and then maybe I got exposed to it, and then two days later I became symptomatic. So the day I become symptomatic is day zero. So the series interval is now if I pass that virus onto somebody else, 
And then they got basically symptomatic, but it took them like two or three days from when I got, they got exposed to me. That would be a series in a row of two to three days. You know, sometimes it could be longer, it could be 14 days. So obviously the shorter the series interval means that not only is it spreading quickly, but I can trans, well, there are not spreading to a lot of people, but it can spread quicker from one person to another. So that can make it a little bit more deadly. So the primary mode of transmission here we're finding is going to be more like respiratory transmission. Uh, there's going to be perhaps some aerosolation of droplets, and that's why they want you to do that distancing as far as the social distancing, because when they do the studies, it kind of comes out to about six feet. Uh, there's some studies that say some of those droplets can project even to objects almost like 25 feet away, uh, and then they become what they call fomites, meaning that if you touch that droplet that has the infected bacteria, and then you touch your mouth, or you touch your face, and call your T-zone, that you then, it gets in your mucosal membranes, uh, it makes you a little bit more at risk of getting that. Uh, also, it could be fecal matter. So generally, if somebody were to go to the bathroom, maybe not necessarily adequately wash their hands, and then touch the doorknob, and you touch that doorknob, uh, it could be transmitted that way. Um, the other thing we don't even think about is sometimes in apartment buildings, um, and I know when I was in Spain, it was an issue because everybody lives in an apartment, if you have sometimes inadequate plumbing inside, inside the building itself, you can have an infected individual and then that virus can be in the plumbing system. And if the plumbing is inadequate, then perhaps other people in the same apartment building can get the viral infection just from the plumbing situation. Now if you look at it as far as then how does this virus do, what does it do and how does it work really? So we know really the prominent thing that it mostly affects first is going to be the respiratory system. But as we learn more and more and more, it actually goes to a lot of different organs because it's going to affect basically a certain receptor that we're going to get into called the H2 receptor. So mostly it's going to be affecting in the lung. The alveoli is just a pocket of the lung. This is kind of where we have the air exchange. So the type, there's two types of cells in there, the matocytes. That just means a fancy word for lung cell. So the type 1 actually works with the gas exchange, where the type 2 produces a thing called surfactant. So for surfactant basically reduces some of the surface tension. So it makes this balloon more likely to expand, makes it easier to expand, as opposed to without the surfactant, and the surface tension would be higher, this would be more likely to collapse. So it would give us less of an area where air can actually get in there. And the pneumocytes, the type 1, actually control some of the gas exchange. So when we breathe air in, we want to get the oxygen into our blood, and when we exhale, we want to get that CO2 out. So the CO2 comes out of the blood, fills up the lungs, and we can expel that. So the problem with this is when it decreases the surfactant, and we'll get into some of those mechanisms, you can see that it doesn't expand as much, so it tends to collapse a little bit more because it doesn't have a chance to reduce the surface tension. So when we talk about that coronavirus, it has a couple different proteins. The most important one is the spike. Um, there's a hemagglutin, also a protein that is involved basically with its attachment. It attaches basically into this ACE2 or angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor um, and gets invaginated or endocytosis into the cell. All right? But the spike actually allows it to attach. So that's one of the things that they potentially might be looking at as far as trying to come up with a cure or a vaccine uh, in regards to that. Now, inside this kind of like almost spaceship, what they call a capsid that's surrounded by a harder envelope, is basically the proteins. And it's kind of like there's two things like DNA we all heard of, and then there's like RNA, uh, which is basically more single-stranded. This is a, a positive, sensitive, single-stranded RNA, RNA, this type of virus. So when that gets into the cell, generally there's things, this opens up, the capsid opens up, and releases that virus, and you have like potentially one virus, say, for sake of argument, that enters into that cell, and it's going to be the type 2 preferentially, although we see that it goes into other cells as well, which is why it causes a problem. So when it gets invaginated, our cell has basically a factory. So we have like ribosomes, which kind of makes proteins that the cell needs to survive. We have things called Golgi apparatuses that kind of encapsulate and actually release stuff that needs to be released. So kind of this virus comes in there and hijacks the cell, uses the ribosomes to make more viruses. So it makes more of these positive sensitive single-stranded RNAs. Also makes a lot of different proteins Basically, and these proteins are kind of the building blocks for the capsid of the virus that kind of help it when it gets out. And then there's proteinases that actually cleave off some of these polyproteins to make the structures. And they use the cell's factory to actually make the capsid, 
the RNA gets inserted in there, so now you have tons of RNA that basically are protected by these capsids and envelopes inside of the cell, and they kind of get released. The other important thing is the cell now also doesn't have the stuff that it needs to survive, because basically it's making stuff and it's busy making things that help it survive, but now it's actually spending its time making more viruses. So the cell actually results in cell death. And that's a problem, because now these things get released, but with the cell death, there's a lot of cytokines, and basically it stimulates the macrophages, and that releases cytokines. And cytokines are just inflammatory components. The, some of the big ones are interleukin-1, 6, uh, tumus necrosis factor alpha. Um, and they cause further inflammation inside there. They also get released into the blood cells, the, basically the blood vessels, rather the endothelial cells that kind of go into the bloodstream and they make those dilate and they make some of the cells contract. So what happens is it kind of like these blood vessels become more permeable. I mean, some of the fluid comes out of them. So if you had a, a cup of water and you just held cupped it in your hand and you opened your fingers as it spread out, the water would come out. And that's one of the things that happens here. So not only do you get local inflammation inside the alveoli itself from all the activity and the death, but you get these blood vessels that are surrounding the alveoli for oxygen exchange, and they seep into the alveoli. So now you have more edema or more fluid inside the alveoli. The other thing is you have more edema on the outside of the alveoli. So that puts additional pressure. So it makes it harder for the alveoli to expand. And if you remember before, we've also wiped out some of the surfactant. So now the, the alveoli itself can't expand so much because that increased surface tension. The other thing that happens with the surfactant, as more of that fluid gets in the alveoli, it dilutes it. And they always say dilution is a solution in pollution. And now you have a less concentration of surfactant. You're making less surfactant. You're having fluid that builds up around, so you're having a bigger barrier. So you can see how all these things really inhibit air exchange. So it really lowers the O2 or the oxygen concentration and increases the PCO2 or the carbon dioxide because now it can't get through there. The other thing that unfortunately happens when this happens, it stimulates neutrophils. So neutrophils are usually kind of our soldiers. We kind of want those to be there. So the neutrophils come in and enter here through this now more permeable area, and they try to attack the viruses. They can do a good job with that, but unfortunately when they attack the viruses, they also attack different cells. So they attack some of those cells are going to be our pneumatocytes, our type 1 and our type 2. So that in effect, again, decreases some more air exchange it decreases surfactant production. The other thing it does, not only this thing can't expand, can't exchange, but now you have a lot of junk that builds up in there. Because you have all these dead cells, all these extra proteins that aren't necessarily normally there. And that junk forms then what we call a consolidation. So it gives you a viral pneumonia. And generally there's some things that it does, it kind of stimulates the vagus nerve, so it kind of tries to make us cough. Uh, most of the times with this particular disease, I uh, believe that productivity of the cough is on the lower side. It's about 30% of the coughs that people have are productive. Most of it's a dry, non-productive cough because they're not able to clear that. But you can see with all these factors, it dramatically decreases the oxygen concentration, which is hypoxia. And we're going to see that's going to affect a lot of the organs. And the other thing is that once it gets into the blood supply, too, generally that affects additional organs, uh, which sometimes we can lead to multi-organ failure. So when the lungs get all jumped up like that and they can't do the oxygen exchange that we normally have, that's what they call acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. So generally when you're at this point, and these are just different x-rays and imaging studies showing you what they call the ground glass, you can see that there's all these white consolidated areas. So these are areas that normally had, would be darker with full of air exchange, but now they're so consolidated and there's so much basically junk in there, dead cells, that generally the air can't get in and they can't basically oxygenate the blood. So once it gets in also to the bloodstream, we're finding out now these H2 receptors are on other organs, or they're on heart organs, they're on pulmonary, liver, kidneys. So generally a couple of things can happen. They can affect those organs directly. So this organ actually can attack the heart. Generally it can basically decrease perfusion. And that's when we look at the systemic inflammatory response, which we're all familiar with. Because we treated people basically with SIRS for a long time. We always had sepsis with SIRS diagnosis. So this is really no different. It's just kind of at a, a deadly point. So we're looking at it. It's basically your temperature, base, your heart rate. 
as the blood vessels dilate, you can imagine your blood pressure kind of tanks, it drops down, right? So when your blood pressure tanks down, that's going to bring up your heart rate because your heart's trying to still perfuse the body. The other thing it does is it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system directly. So that only increases the heart rate by working on the SA and the AV nodes. It affects the hypothalamus area, kind of resets your thermostat. So basically now your body gets hotter, and that's why we have some of the fevers. Like I was saying, it irritates the vagus nerve. That gives us some of the cough. You know, when the blood vessels start to constrict or we become decreased flow, then there's less flow to the heart. So then you can end up with more ischemia of the heart because now there's decreased blood flow. You can end up with renal failure because now the kidneys aren't perfused as well. You can end up with liver problems um, and things in regards to that. Um, also can affect the cognition as far as altered mental status. So just here to talk about now some of the definitions of why we have some of the restrictions that we have here over at Allied. So looking at the droplet precautions, and this is just really a definition. So they're saying the gloves, gown, and surgical masks. And those are the things that are required. And like I say, really, in my mind, the surgical mask and the hygiene are probably the most important thing. And the thing that we have to stress really is, is the mask on the individual, on the patient, right? Because those are the people that are going to get up to spread it more so than us. And the goggles, goggles are only needed really if we kind of aerosolize products. So somebody is basically getting on a nebulizer treatment, or if you have nurses or respiratory therapists that are suctioning individuals, or sometimes speech therapists that we're working with feeding, or some incident where the patient may be spitting or coughing up directly in your face, uh, then the goggles could be important to kind of protect you in that area. Now these are enhanced, so these are more precautions, right? Because they're enhanced, that means better than the regular precautions. So here again, it's going to be the glove gowns and masks, uh, and goggles. The goggles are more required at this point. Now, we're giving everybody N95 masks because there is some stuff that shows that there's a little bit less leakage in that, especially if it's properly fitted, though fitting sometimes is difficult. Really, the CDC is only recommending a surgical mask, right? So, so we're kind of going a little bit above and beyond even what the CDC is recommending. And we'll see as we go through some of this, a lot of the stuff that we've instilled are clearly beyond the CDC recommendations because we're trying to protect, I mean, you guys, obviously, and other patients, right? Now looking at the asymptomatic exposed people. Now, this is basically if you're coming in close contact, usually for a prolonged period of time, and the key thing is here is unprotected contact. So you get a little bit nervous because you're coming through the doors of one of the allied facilities and they say, have you ever been exposed to a COVID patient? You know, even when I hear that question, I'm like, geez, that's what I do. I mean, I go to the general hospital, I go to Geisner, I go to allied facilities, I've been on COVID units. So yeah, I've been exposed to COVID patients, but I've always been wearing all my proper protective equipment, right? So I'm not truly exposed, so even though I've come in closer contact, you know, because I'm listening to lungs and auscultating, generally it's not, I'm not exposed because I'm protected. And that's what they're talking about here. So if somebody that we know is exposed, but generally they have no symptoms, we're going to see that we still put those on a little bit of quarantine because they potentially could develop them later because they don't always get it right away. And it's just as far as what we do as far as the N95 mask, as far as how much we use them. So right now we're limited to five shifts, right? So it can't be used any more than five shifts. The thought is that maybe there's some degradation in the safety at that point, or eight hours. So you're supposed to log it in. So sometimes, you know, if you're a healthcare provider and you're in a hospital and you're using that mask all day, I mean, that may be one shift, not might necessarily five shift, but the eight hours might be in the one shift. Or if your contact is a little bit more limited and stuff like that, you know, maybe it is going to be five shift as you spread about. Now we're using a lot of the reusable, like the Canon N95 mask, which I personally find a hard time breathing with, but, but generally, obviously, they have very good protection, spraying them down with Virex and all. We want you to keep it in a paper bag or something that can air it out, right? So if you put it in like a Ziploc bag, you got some moisture and you got the virus in there. Generally, that kind of perpetuates basically the virus as far as the length of that it could survive, or not that it's really surviving, but the length of time that it could really infect somebody. But if you air it out and it dries out, that generally decreases the virus as far as the longevity of it, which they can be an effective product. So that's why they want it in some type of paper bag or something that's kind of absorbent, and not something that contains the moisture in there. Obviously, these kind of go out of the question. If you're doing like a nebulizer treatment or the virus is aerosolized, then you kind of use the mask for that because that's really when you need it the most and the goggles at that point too. But you want to discard it after that because now there's going to be a lot of potentially viral contents on the outside of that. And then generally you have an increased propensity of then spreading the virus beyond that. And, you know, if it's soiled, and really when they say it's kind of reserved, so it's truly reserved, 
for basically people at the high risk context. So, so people that are doing the suctioning, people that are doing the nebulizer treatment. So you're going to see the respiratory therapist, some of the nurses. You know, so you're involved with that. If you happen to be involved with somebody who's having coughing fits, you know, obviously you want to mask them. And that would be an example that might be a little bit more of a higher risk. So we're talking about the surgical mask, and this is kind of what the CDC recommends, and this is almost what my preference is. And generally, when I was talking to Dr. Diary Decker, who's one of our infectious disease doctors, he was saying there really haven't been any instances where somebody, where the patient or the individual is wearing a surgical mask and the healthcare provider is wearing a surgical mask, you know, with good hand gene, that there was any kind of transmission, right? So the big thing comes into it is, particularly when the individual, and it's hard sometimes to get patients to wear a mask because they don't like them, and I, I round every day and I see that, and I know that probably instills a lot of fear in you guys, but, but they just don't want to wear them. So, so that's really, the buck stops there, that cuts off a lot of things, you know. If you had a spray paint, you know, spray paint, and you put the cup in front of the spray paint and squeeze it, it's not going to let that spray go anywhere, but you take it off, it can spray up a whole wall, right? So here, same thing, we're going to keep those in the paper bag. People that don't really have contact, you know, the, the patients get one, one once a week. We give them a new mask and we're very good about that here. Staff members, so if you're like a secretary in your office and you don't really have contact with the patients, you're coming to work, then you just get a mask once a week. Again, if it's soiled or somehow tampered or torn or something like that, obviously discard it, you get a new one. But this is generally how long it could last for. And we're trying to kind of preserve some of our protective equipment here, right? Because there is a shortage and everybody understands that. And people that aren't exposed, because obviously there are still people in the hospital that haven't been exposed, that have no symptoms. I mean, we don't really anticipate that we're going to need to isolate them. We still screen, because generally at this point, because of the contagiousness and the spreadability of this, anybody that's kind of having a fever, Obviously, we're suspicious of, even if they have no other symptoms, because generally at this point, many people have it and are asymptomatic. So these people are still getting screened when we evaluate it, but obviously we still want to take them into the hospital. So here's what happens when people are asymptomatic exposed. So, so generally you say they had some contact, they weren't necessarily wearing their protective equipment. We know that basically the person that they had contact in truly was you know, positive for COVID-19. So they had the virus in them. We quarantined them for 14 days, right? So the thought is, and I went through this myself, I was on vacation in Spain when all this came down, I had to kind of fly home emergently because I thought if I flew home, got to work, got a test, everything would be pretty good within a week. Uh, but still, I couldn't come back to work for 14 days. You know? I would say it would have been better if I got the virus, because if I got the virus, I could have came back to work in one week, you know, as long as I was asymptomatic for three days, and geez, I was never symptomatic. I mean, I think the day that they swabbed me and they stuck that thing in my brain cells, uh, at that point I biked 30 miles. Yeah, I was going to have any symptoms today? I was just mountain biking for about 30 miles before he came in. Um, but generally at this point, we're still admitting the people on a case by case. And it's always, we'll see these, the three S's, and Dr. Wolf was very good about that. It's one of the things he says I really, really do like a lot. And the staff supplies in space, right? So we have to have somewhere to put them. We have to make sure we have an adequate protective equipment for the patients as well as for the healthcare providers. And generally, we have a space in the staff. I mean, sometimes we had an incident where we had a hold off on some of the missions, not because there was a big outbreak or anything, but there was somebody that was exposed and generally proved to be COVID positive, and they were a staff member, and then there was other staff members that were potentially exposed, and they were feeling a little bit ill. So now we're a little bit understaffed, and generally we weren't sure if they were getting COVID-19 or if they were just getting a common cold or a flu. It ended up being that it was just more non-COVID, so it was more other illnesses, uh, but we wouldn't have enough staff really to bring new people in in a safe manner. So what do we do for these people? And, and these ones, at this point, we've all seen, just only we had the whole unit, we made the whole unit asymptomatic exposed because we weren't sure what was going on at the time. But the doors are closed, we're going the surgical mask on the resident, right? Surgical mask for the healthcare provider, so the PP we're talking about, so you're still wearing your gowns, your gloves, if you're doing something that you think there might be spray, you know, if you're suctioning them, if you're feeding them, the guy's refusing to wear his mask, then the goggles might be appropriate. They're always made available. You know, so generally at this point, you don't necessarily need them, but if you feel even more comfortable with them, obviously they're there for you. They do have therapy because obviously it'd be a kind of a disservice. These people are asymptomatic, they're exposed, we don't even know if they have the virus, and generally if we don't do anything, we know they're gonna become deconditioned if not depressed for being socially isolated. So they're doing therapy, but it's in the room, and they're on those droplet precautions. 
that's what we go through there. And as we mentioned previously, then the goggles would be kind of as needed. Now the people under investigation. So these are people that we know had contact and maybe they spike up a temperature or basically they have some of the symptoms that are basically are consistent with the COVID-19 disease that they may have the viral infection. So generally at that point, we put them in isolation right away and we want to get a COVID test, right? Because we want to see if they're positive or not. So generally one of the first things we do, we get the test, we put them in isolation. Uh, generally they're going to be there for at least seven days, right? So if they're positive, if this COVID-19 is positive, like I would previously indicated, then generally they're staying in the room for seven days, completely isolated. If they don't have any further symptoms for at least 72 hours, that means no fever, and they're not on anything like antipyretics, like Tylenol or anything, like I'm not sure that can lower their blood, or temperature rather, then generally we can start treating them differently. And they'll be, we'll get into some of that as far as the COVID recovered people. If it's negative, then we might re release them from those precautions. That's going to be up to the physician, right? Because you have to observe it or in the healthcare provider. So the physician, we have not just the physician, but we also have an infectious specialist uh, and generally the nursing staff. So we get everybody involved really to decide whether these people are like a high risk or not high risk. I mean, there's many people that we treat with pneumonias and other illnesses, UTIs, uh, that fall within these categories. So we have to treat everybody as if they have it, even if they don't, even if, even if the suspicion is kind of a little bit on the lower side. So the people that are under investigation, we've had a number of these at Heinz, and I'm sure they've had many over at Allied as well. I just don't go up there as much. Generally, it's going to be those enhanced droplet precautions. So now, generally, we're saying you kind of should wear your goggles at this point because we don't really know what the situation is. So you have to assume that these people are positive, right? They may not be. And, and many of the people, and probably I almost to say almost all the people I've had under suspicion, so maybe a couple, have been negative, right? But we have to assume they're positive. The door is closed, the surgical mask. You know, we're giving you the N95 mask. Again, not that you need it. And the CDC doesn't necessarily say you have to have that. They recommend the surgical mask. But generally, Allied is kind of going above and beyond what the CDC is recommending because we don't know. And there, there's no truth there. So as long as we have these masks available to everybody, generally we're going to provide them to everybody. You know, as the supply potentially might get lower, then we'll be using more of the surgical masks and reserving some of those N95 masks for the people that are truly at the higher risk. Those guys, guys suction, the guys doing the aerosol treatments and nebulizers. Because that's kind of where it comes into play. Some of these people will have therapy, they'll continue to have therapy, but again, that's going to be the physician's judgment. So if we think maybe there's a low suspicion, like I'm thinking this guy maybe has like a UTI or we know he's got a pneumonia, he's on antibiotics, he kind of meets the criteria, I got to put him in and assume he's positive, I got the test. But generally at this point, as long as they're wearing the full PPE, they can go and do therapy in the room. We obviously don't want him out of the room because we don't know what the situation is. You know? Seven days, just like if you had it, seven days from the onset of the symptoms, right? And then 72 hours again, fever free. Now the other testing is they have the two test protocol. And generally as we move on more and more and get later and later with this disease, this may be more likely to occur. Initially the testing and the reagents are so much in a shortage uh, that we're not able to do this. I mean, geez, when I got my test, it literally took over a week. Uh, my partner also had a test, it took him 48 hours. You know, and now I had admitted a patient your um, telling you who was suspected, a patient under investigation, so I asked if they could get a test before she came in, and they got the results in four hours, the guys here. So, I mean, this has moved along a lot quicker, so the other thing is they're looking for two negative tests, potentially 24 hours apart. We have to take some of the tests, too, with a grain of salt, uh, both ways, really, because sometimes there's a higher rate of false negatives, so generally maybe it wasn't done adequately, didn't go back as far, uh, there are some studies now showing that really in the earlier stages, like the first two to five days since with the onset of symptoms, there's a large amount of the viral load inside the nasal pharyngeal area, so that's generally more accommodating for that swab. But as you move along further, sometimes these are negative, even though now the virus is still in the respiratory system. So they're saying maybe if they did a sputum sample five to ten days out or so, that might be positive even if the nasal pharyngeal is, is negative. And then even like fecal samples. So sometimes that goes out even further, like 10 to 15 days. The other thing is that sometimes it could be positive. So not just to say with the negatives, but it could be positive. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're still infectious. They might be beyond that period. And it might be just the products that break down portions of the RNA that's still registering positive, even though that those RNA are degraded and no longer infectious. So there's still a lot of variables, and we're still pretty unsure about all that type of stuff. 
Now, for these are the people that are positive. So they get the swab, and we know that they're positive, right? So we're, telling you, we're not admitting those people to the hospital until they're seven days out or 72 hours, fever-free, asymptomatic. Just like if a healthcare provider were to get it and come to work, just like the, we have a couple of healthcare providers at this point, physicians, a couple of aides, who are positive, and at this point now are outside of those seven days and had gladly come back to work and are working hard. Here are the two negative tests may also be applied. Remember, there's some things either way that kind of goes with that, but generally they have to be 24 hours apart. And you have to be really careful that you go far back. They say, let's tickle the brain cells in order to get that. And again, there's a case-by-case -case review. So even with this, even with the two negative tests, the physicians and the nurse liaisons, the people that are bringing people into that light are still reviewing the cases to make sure that it's okay. So when they're positive, again, the enhanced drop with precautions, right? Because those, these are the people that we know are positive. So to me, there's almost a sense of empowerment. Like everybody's, ooh, my, you know, are you afraid to go into like a COVID unit or something like that? I go, no, because at this point, we know they have COVID. We're taking the precautions. We got our masks, we got our goggles, got the gowns, they may be good. We're doing really good hand washing. We're being very precautious. We're taking a lot of precautions. The people I always say you gotta be concerned about is when I go home with, I see my kids, right? They could have it, they could be asymptomatic. The people out there could be asymptomatic. And sometimes when you're in a home situation, you might be a little bit more lax. That's where literally where the social distancing comes into play. The masks are great importance, and, and really the mask and the hygiene, the hand hygiene and the mask. And if we know that they're positive, it gives us really a sense of empowerment. So it's not that we should be afraid of it, we should actually feel more secure with that, because we know the precautions to take, we know what we're going into. As opposed to the people that are asymptomatic, those are the people that we don't know. So sometimes I think that is, to me, a little bit more fearful. So the surgical mask on the resident, and, and to me, again, that's, that's the biggest thing. I mean, if you can stop the virus from coming out, I mean, then we're good, right? That stops mostly all of it. Our masks, again, here, we're using the N95 masks. Again, they recommend it to surgical masks. Um, sometimes I think surgical masks are a little bit easier to breathe through, and in some of the hospital situations, I'll just use the surgical mask because that's what's available for me. Uh, but here we make the N95 masks available for you guys, so we're giving you the best that we have. And again, so this is going above and beyond, so it should be a little bit more comforting for some individuals. And I think that's important too, if nothing else, there's been so much hype about the N95 mask, that there's some people that really would be fearful with that. So I think it's, it's a good crutch, and I think as long as we provide you with enough stability and generally feel as comfortable, then you're going to provide, obviously, better care for the patients. Here we don't give them any therapy, right, which is... A little bit of a disadvantage, but we're trying to mitigate some of the risk, I mean, for the healthcare providers and other people in the hospital situations. So we're really trying to isolate into that room, and we want to avoid that prolonged contact, because there is some things that say, you know, the more prolonged contact there is, um, the more likely there is to transmit the infection. Here we're going with the 14 days, right? So they're going for 14 days from the onset of symptoms, and then 72 hours fever free. So really on the 15th day, Generally, we can reinstill those people. Uh, generally, if they're asymptomatic, then all they really need is a surgical mask. The healthcare provider just needs a surgical mask. Again, good hand hygiene or gloves. Uh, and they can even go down to the regular gym, right? So, so these are the people that are positive. Now, we did say 14 to 21, because again, it's gonna be up to the physician as well as our infectious specialist to determine if they still have symptoms and they still have issues. Then even though it's 14 days, we're trying not to pick a hard number that may be extended, because we know that some people can shed beyond 21, sometimes even up to 28 days, they say the sicker you are, sometimes the longer you shed. What we don't know though, and it's really deemed by the CCC right now, they're speculating after the 14 days, even though they're shedding virus, after the 14 days, those viruses are no longer infective, because it's not really truly just the virus, but it's components, as we talked about the breakdown components of the SSRNA, uh, as opposed to the true virus intact uh, to make it infectious. So here's the people that are recovered. So now we're starting to see some of those. I know they got more up at Allied um, than we do as far as recovered patients. We got a couple of COVID patients here at Heinz. Um, so these people also using the same parameters as we previously indicated. So we know they had it. We don't want to bring them in before that week, right? Because that's going to be the higher rate of transmissibility. Remember that series interval was mostly, they were saying initially 2.5 to 3.5, but maybe now like two to six, somewhere around four being on the average. Uh, so generally at this point, if they're asymptomatic for those three days, and generally that's without a fever in particular, 
obviously some people are going to be short of breath and they may be short of breath forever because of some of the lung disease that they got. There might be scar tissue and they may have some permanent restrictive disease. We call it chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Using those two negative tests, again, 24 hours apart or three days apart, so you're getting two different tests two days apart. Again, this is still a little bit hard to get because right now there's just not enough reagent, there's not enough availability for that. Um, but generally, as it becomes more available, uh, this may become more of our standard there. And again, we're going to install a case by case, so even if they get through all these criteria, we're still looking at them pretty hard because obviously we want to provide the best for the case patient, but we want to provide the most protection for the staff here in Allied. The recovered patients are still going to be on those enhanced droplet precautions, right, because we're still under the assumption that they have it. Still masking, again, the patient, that's the most important thing, and sometimes they're reluctant to do so, you're closing the doors, just because we're trying not to have it spread. Remember I was talking about those fomites, sometimes they can go up to 25 feet away, right, so generally in a hospital room, if the door is open, potentially that virus can get ejected out beyond the room if the door is open. They're having therapy in the rooms, and sometimes the COVID gym, depending on how many people we have, at some point we might break things down where this portion of the hospital is going to be the recovered COVID patients or active COVID patients, or some of them are not getting therapy, some of them are getting therapy in the room, some of them might be able to even come down to a gym that we kind of separate and isolate just for the COVID individuals. Here we're using again that 14 days, and again we're going above and beyond, you know, so generally we're being extra precautious here, sometimes even up to 21. Again, seven days is kind of standard. You know, if you got COVID or I got COVID, we can come back to work and see patients, see debilitated patients after seven days, right? But we're basically spreading out the 14 to even 21 potentially, depending on what the symptoms are. And again, that is more for your protection, but also the protection of the other patients in the facility. Because we deal with kind of a high risk and vulnerable population. I mean, most of our patients are old and have multiple medical comorbidities. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be in rehab. Generally, after this period, again, it's just a mask and mask. We just go for the surgical mask. Again, the patient, that's always what I say is the most important, masking yourself, and then go back down to the regular gym. You know? So we're trying to get them back more into the mainstream because they're no longer infectious. So, so really, the whole crux of this, we kind of went through some of this stuff, and it's really not to say, hey, this is a scary thing. It's about really our sense of empowerment. It's going to be the hand washing, social distancing, you know, staying away from the T-zone. You know, this is just enforcing that. That's really the protective thing. So, so for us, really, the surgical masks and the hand hygiene is probably the most important thing. Masking the patients that we're working with, with healthcare providers. And again, Allied's really going above and beyond. I mean, they're extending those time periods, you know, 14 to 21 days as opposed to seven. They're giving you the N95 masks as long as they're available at this point, even though really the surgical masks are things are recommended. But, but, and we know, we know which people at this point are having it and people that we're suspecting of having it. So, so again, in that regards, it's a safer environment and really gives us a stronger, at least it does for me, a stronger sense of empowerment. So this I said, the end or, or hopefully not. So I guess that concludes this portion of the lecture.